Um, yeah, so that one of the advantages uh, with the fact that we've gotten to know the audience with Resbomb is the fact that you know I've now connected directly with people interested in American Indian cinema, so I can take uh, a Thunder Being Nation to them and, and and have you know be able to gauge roughly how many units I'm likely to sell and what I can get back from it to actually be able to say well I'll, then I'll spend this amount of resources on uh, on getting it polished off, so it's not just all my lap, but maybe hire somebody else to. Uh, you know, to push through with it, that that might, you know, well be one of the knock-on advantages. And even then, you've got that also got the advantage of then bundling the two together, and then, you know, the audience more drawn to one, then knocking into the other. So you know, it, it's kind of a neat, you know, we have this new model in terms of how we can access, you know, the audience. I mean, you know, right now with direct distribution, I'm making many, many times more per unit than. I would on a typical distribution deal, even though at the moment we're selling to a fraction of the numbers. It's sort of this kind of game, you know, can I hit, you know, if I can hit 10% of the audience I was getting before, I'm making comfortably more money um, and getting it immediately and it not being cross collateralized against um, expenses against sales to other territories and all that usual nonsense that sales companies do. Oh, you mean in terms of location and the subject, or you know, you know, the irony I've found is that in some respects, people in Europe know as much, if not more, than people in the States. It's in America, reservation life is, and the situation on the reservations is their dirty little secret, and it's it's astonishing when you look in the media. Uh, you know, for example. You have a the best chat show in America is Charlie Rose, and it's very in depth, and he covers all subjects. He's been going for years. Archives all online, so you can go through his back catalog of of um, guests, and it's very much an open forum. Politics, arts, everything. To my knowledge, I could only find one American Indian guest on his show. Whereas, for example, you compare population-wise in America, there's similar amount of Jewish Americans to American Indians, whereas. Hispanic or African Americans are far, far, far greater population, and you compare the population, the the, the guests from those two com communities, car comparable population-wise, and it's it's astronomical. It's probably about 300, 400 to one or something, um, and that's in something where they go beyond the culture, and so you know you find a, a civil rights discussion there where. Almost the, the you know the funny thing is the only person I find in American culture who who talks about American Indian issues ironically is Chris Rock, and he's the only person that really seems to get it in mainstream culture there. Uh, but it's swept under the carpet entirely. Uh, I mean the justice system there doesn't apply to American Indians. Uh, the in the same way I mean the. Uh, on a reservation, a, a tribal policeman has no jurisdiction over the seven major crimes. So the local cops ha cannot, uh, they don't deal with murder and things like that. They're reliant on someone coming from an FBI office elsewhere, which is federal. And, and often they don't turn up. I mean, you might have someone waiting for a year for an interview to be done because somebody next door molested your child. And if they never interview you, nothing, I mean, it's not even a case of going to trial. It's someone coming down to interview and take a statement. And, and that's routine. Um, but anyway. Um, but the, the, the thing with it is interesting that as a film, um, you know, Razbomb, there was, I mean, I think there were about four, four and a half thousand uh, feature films submitted to Sundance last year. And you know a lot of them will be relatively loosely termed feature films shall we say but 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 there's a lot you know there's maybe 3000 that stack up now you can either choose to be a, a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a small pond and the ad advantage we've got with Resbomb is that there were perhaps three movies set in Indian country last year uh, none of them have casts sort of as established as mine and the other thing is, most of them are relatively culturally specific. So, 
you know, again, people in res you know, in interested in that sort of thing, if they want something entertaining in that world, which people generally is their first priority, then they have very few options. So it's been interesting, but we've been very much hitting that market first. Uh, I mean, the irony is that, you know, in a year, I'm likely to make as much money out of a gas station in South Dakota selling the DVD as I did from um, a sales agent selling a DVD of one of my previous films to Germany once they take their commissions and their expenses and whatever else and and so it's it's interesting it, it's changing the you know the landscape a bit mm. Um, well, you know, I, I I flew back, you know, from LA to be at this, you know, Aberdeen Film Festival, and I, it was kind of great to see something being done locally. Um, and interesting, the fact that I actually came from the Shire Council, because um, normally it's sort of individual groups that set up these sorts of things, and it's nice to see the council being proactive that way. But I think, um, you know, ultimately, if it's going to move forward, it really needs somebody locally with their funding but but somebody with the sort of expertise at running something like this and the two to be put together um, be, you know because it needs more publicity it needs the audience getting behind it more um, that sort of thing I mean it has to happen on all levels and it's great that the councillor you know we're, we're putting this out there but but I think it really needs other people to take on the baton and, and run with it and, and actually make it you know, expand more um, and expand in scope. I mean, it would have been very easy for me to have brought in, um, you know, a number of sort of top films that were in the international festival circuit in the last year because I've gotten to know a lot of filmmakers from that that, you know, have become friends and would have been happy for it. You know, so you could have expanded into scope. Um, you know, nice to see something that's focusing on the local film, lo you know, that, that has been emerging over the last few years. The, the, there's something I find very interesting about the filmmakers from Aberdeen. It's not not like anywhere else I've ever seen, uh, certainly in the UK at least, in that the people here are doing movies more than films. And, and I think that's a compliment to their ambition. Uh, you know, the majority of people elsewhere are always doing these kind of introspective more kind of art house indie movies whereas you know Ara is doing action movies where they might be low budget and whatever else but the choreography is quite simply world class I mean you will not find I guarantee you will not find you know a guy running around with a camera doing things of that caliber pretty much anywhere else other than some insane people in Hong Kong perhaps um, so you know the, that foundation is extraordinary. Likewise, you know, you know, Mark Sturton doing what is ultimately a very commercial-minded piece. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, that's quite interesting to see. I think. Um, you know, likewise, you know, my, you know, my work as well, very sort of high concept. And the fact that they're just doing it, and regardless of anything, I, I think is quite interesting. But uh, there's there's a story which I. I think really sums up how Aberdeen isn't that far away from the film industry as much as people would imagine is um, you know and this is in addition to the people the fact that all six people locally who worked on ties who had never worked professionally in the industry all became professional in the industry but there was there was one day three and a half years ago in LA where I made two phone calls the first was to an American producer and she's produced some you know reasonable sized films and she said, where in Scotland are you from? I said, Aberdeen. We're an Aberdeen cult. So she said, oh, funny. In the 70s, I used to teach at the American school, which was half a mile from where I grew up. The second call I made was to the William Morris Agency, one of the big three agencies in LA. Just never spoken to the guy before. The guy picks up the phone. I said, hi, my name's Steve Simpson. I'm a filmmaker from Scotland. He says, is, is that the Steve Simpson that used to live on Abbots Hall Road? Yes. You remember the kid that used to live in the house opposite? That's me. Turned out, when we were doing ties, which was based out of that house, he'd come home from school, he'd see the vehicles coming in and out every day, read about it in the paper, 
was the first time he realized the film industry was something that was really viable. And he is now co-producer on Grey Skull with Joel Silver, who is one of the most successful producers in history, the Die Hard movies, the Lethal Weapon movies, the Matrix movies, so on and so forth. And if it goes into production, it'll be a hundred to hundred and fifty million dollar movie, and it will be his first involvement as a producer in a movie. And this is a kid that used to live across the road from me in, in cults. So there's nothing remote about it. The only thing that makes it remote is your own limitations of ambition and whatever else. I mean, it, 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 um, and so I'd like to see these guys locally who are doing, you know, these sort of ambitious and scope things sort of take it to the next level. I mean, take it to the point where, you know, they're upping the visual standard by, you know, when they have. Uh, you know, having a budget, they're hiring a good director of photography and, and f are, f are bringing up their actors rather than just local. And, you know, there are things that are very much within their f the framework that they could do to up the game because uh, their ambition is already there. But I think it's just really pulling it all in together and realizing that, you know, if what you're doing is of this standard, but you build, you know, you need to build the technical around it up to a certain standard as well. Um, I mean, that was my advantage with Ty starting out. I mean, I wouldn't have known how to shot my first movie. I mean, I know now. Um, but by bringing in, you know, people from further afield, um, you know, and, and, and just, even just sort of having the confidence to do that and, and start pulling the different sides of it together. Because, um, I mean, and, and the funny thing is, I mean, I, I, I sort of was talking to somebody the other day about how the great thing about youth is you'll just try anything. And, you know, when I, as I say, when I started in Aberdeen, there was nothing being made in Scotland, hardly anything being made in Britain. I think 35 features a year I made ties in the whole of the UK. Um, but my first ever meeting in the film business anywhere uh, was in New York was Robert De Niro's company. Now, at that point, it was harder to get a meeting. I mean, as I said, the Scottish Film Production Fund wouldn't even read a script, but I was getting you know, De Niro's company read my stuff. It's like, it's just, it's just, you know, sometimes when, when you, the bigger people are the easiest to deal with. I mean, well, yeah, but, and, and that's the thing, if, if the, uh, it just, it comes down to how strong is the script at the end of the day, but you can get people to look at it. I mean, it's hard nowadays if you're not got an agent or a lawyer sending it through, but, but there are ways around that as well. You can talk your way into that uh, if they're interested enough in your story. Um, you know, I mean, I after I did Ties, I mean, you know, I go to Cannes and you know, Miramax would take me out for dinner because they liked my first film and they wanted to see what was happening next. Still nobody in Scotland was giving me the time of day, you know, and I think that's the thing. The one line that I hate from Scottish filmmakers more than anything was, well, yeah, but it was knocked back by Scottish screen. Who gives a crap? You know, I mean, in America, they don't have that option. I mean, in, in, you go to some of the other regions in the UK and they will go, hold on a second, our population's the same size as Scotland and we've got a tenth of the pot. You know, it's, you know, so what? I mean, you know, you look at, um, you know, look at Paul McGuigan. I mean, he did his first film in Scotland, then his, you know, fourth film with Bruce Willis. I mean, it's like, not that that, counts for anything but it's just like he's now you know he's now doing you know very high budget Hollywood movies um, you know because I think there's there's so much you can grind things out here but you can go as far as the scope of your ideas you know so I mean that's the thing it's a it's a global business it's not about one place or another so no problem <laughs>